4. What we're talking about this evening is the type of people God uses, and we're going to use Moses as an illustration of that. Exodus chapter 4, now we'll understand a lot of things take place here in the first few verses, in verses 1 through 10, and where God is calling Moses and telling him that he can serve him, he wants him to serve him. But Moses has a hang-up, he's a little bit confused, he doesn't think he's worthy to be used of God. If you look in the first verse, he's, Moses is already making up excuses. He says in the first verse 1, he says, They will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. And then he has, says something else. He's assuming something. He says, they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And so Moses is a little concerned because God has given him a job to do. And you and I know because we get to read back into history and we see it's a tremendous job. And it took a lot longer than Moses expected to because Moses never really reached the promised land. He did not go, get to go into the promised land, first of all, because of his sin and also because of the sin of the people. And I cannot imagine him wandering around 40 years in the wilderness doing something that he wished he never really had to do, leading a nation. But he, later on in life, I'm, a, I'm sure that he understood, at least in glory he understands, the importance how, of how God used him uh, to lead these people out of Egypt because it was a big deal. It was a major deal. And he is one of the me main characters in the Bible and the Word of God that is referred to even in the book New Testament. They refer back to Moses. So God used him in a, in a uh, very uh, powerful way. And he's making excuses for not being uh, available or not being worthy to use. Um, and God gave him three different signs. He says, what's that in your hand? And he tells him to throw his rod down, pick it back up. Verse 5, he, uh, God gives him a sign. He says, that they may believe. And he tells him to do something else. Verse 6, and the Lord said, furthermore unto them. We look at all these things that how God is speaking to him. God is, uh, Moses needs some convincing. He needs some convincing. Now let's begin at verse 10. The Bible says in verse 10, And Moses said unto the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither here, uh, heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Who maketh the dumb or the deaf or the seeing or the blind? And then notice what God says, Have not I the Lord? I look at this, and this is kind of interesting. Just the fact where God says, who maketh the blind? Who maketh the deaf? Who makes these people? Who makes these people uh, uh, where they, what we would call handicaps? People who have disabilities. And, you know, some people will say, will say well, God didn't make you that way. Sin made you. But God's saying, I made them that way. Is that a problem with that? Well, how, why would God be so cruel? I have a brother with Down syndrome. And you say, why would God be so cruel? Do you understand sometimes these are blessings to us? It really is. And I've got to point to this in just a minute. And uh, because there's something special here. God made these people because with, with, let's say you were deaf. Or that maybe you were blind. And sometimes we can, we can look in the New Testament and see where Paul says some things about uh, uh, as he's getting older, he's got a thorn in the flesh. What did those things do to Paul, or what do they do to these people that have handicaps? It causes them to lean on something else that's greater than them. Plus, also, God gifts them with something else that you and I probably don't have. Maybe they can't see, but they have another sight that you and I don't have. They have an insight, and they can perceive differently than we can. They might not be able to hear but they have their eyes, their vision is enhanced to where they can hear through their eyes to the point of uh, they can see things in you and I we just don't notice, you know. Uh, they're gifted of God. But look down at verse 12. Notice what God says, and this is the key to what we just read. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth. Notice who's going to be with thy mouth? God. I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. That's special, but notice what Moses said. And he said, O oh, my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Verse 14 tells us, kind of gives us a little idea what he's talking about. And the anger 
of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Why, why was God angry at that? Because Moses is complaining. God is giving him signs. God says, Moses says, I'm not an eloquent of speech. I am slow of speech. I am slow of tongue. God says, who made man's mouth? Who, who maketh the dumb? That's somebody who can't speak. Uh, who maketh the deaf? Who maketh the blind? I have, God says. And here Moses says, he continue on, but God says, Moses, I'll be a mouth for you. I will teach you how to speak. I will teach you what to say. God said, Moses, I want to be close to you. I want to have something special with you and nobody else. And Moses says, I don't want it. I don't want that from you. Find somebody else. Now, you and I understand that that's not what Moses is saying or doing. But I don't even know that Moses understands what he's saying or what God's saying. God wants that special closeness with Moses. I will be your handicap. I will be that thing that you need. I will be everything you need to complete you. And Moses says, find somebody else. Please, there's got to be somebody else. That's why God was angry. The point here is God wants a special relationship with each and every one of us. He wants that closeness with you. And here's the thing is, we all got problems. We all have handicaps of some sort or another. And God can overlook those things. All right, He can, he can be everything you need for Him to be. Verse 14 again. And it says, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said... <clears throat> Here's the compromise. Is not Aaron the, Le uh, the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And, uh, and thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth. Notice this. And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth. God, now, now Moses is sharing God with somebody else. And will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto thy people, and he shall be, uh, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. Wow. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt go, uh, shalt do signs. So we see what God's saying here. Uh, Moses is complaining, find somebody else, please. And God says, all right, Aaron's your brother, right? He can speak well. All right, we're going to use him. He's your mouth instead of God. That's sad. That's why God was angry, because God wants to be everything you need. He, needs, he wants to be everything that completes you. And when you look at the first couple of verses there, verse 11, who made the man's mouth, who maketh the dumb, who maketh the deaf, who maketh the seeing, who maketh the, the blind, God says, I have. Because in every person's life, God wants to be what's needed to complete that person. God's good. Let's uh, pray before we continue on. Father, in Jesus' name, fill me with your spirit and your power, and I ask in Christ's name that you'll uh, give us great insight from thy word. Grow us, Lord, stronger with you. Help our relationship to be strong. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. We look at the life of Moses, and we see that he was called to do something magnificent. To him, it was terrifying. But he was called of God to deliver enslaved, hurting people out of bondage. Here's something that you and I need to understand. God did use Moses because Moses allowed himself to be available to God. Yes, he argued. He, he made excuses for a while. But, and we do the same thing. But Moses made himself available to God. I think of D.L. Moody. You, everybody knows him. Great evangelist and preacher who led thousands of people to the Lord. But D.L. Moody was not really a great English major. He didn't know good speech. Once in a while, I, I know English pretty well. I goof around and I say, ain't done it and things like that. That's improper English. And I, I remember in high school, I had a teacher that uh, she would get up there. She was very articulate in her vocabulary. And she'd say the words very properly. And then uh, uh, some of us guys would use the word ain't. And she says, ain't is not in the dictionary. Pulled out her dictionary. Yes, ma'am, it sure is. <laughs> you know, uh, and she wasn't too happy about that. And then we would use things like double negatives, uh, ain't done it or uh, <laughs> whatever stuff like that. And then she would argue with us: you're not supposed to use two negatives, but in math, two negatives equal a positive. 
we frustrated our teacher. But anyways, uh, D.L. Moody was not an English major. And he's up there speaking. And one day, this, this young guy comes in. He was an English major. major. And he came in to listen to D.L. Moody preach. And at the uh, end of the service, he goes up to D.L. Moody with a notepad. And he says, Mr. Moody, do you realize that you made 38 grammatical errors during your sermon? Oh, man. If you want to tick off a preacher, you do something like that, okay? <laughs> Take notes on the message, not on his grammar. I, I say some stupid things one time. Uh, not one time, a lot. A lot. You know, uh, one time I was talking about the fruit of the womb. It didn't come out that way. It came out fruit of the loom. I didn't even recognize it. I'm still going on, and people are chuckling, and I'm stopping and looking. What in the world did I just say? And they told me fruit of the loom. I was like, ah, oh, you know, stupid things preacher says. Brother Allison, he's famous for this one. He's preaching on Isaiah 40, 31. But they that mount up with wings as eagles shall renew their strength. I'm sorry. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. And he's talking about mounting up with wings as eagles. And, and this is the end of the message. I mean, the Holy Spirit's working, and people are ready to come forward. And he says, mount up with wings as eagles. And everybody's saying, amen. He thought, I'm going to say it again for the... For the power, the impact. They shall mount up with ings as weagles. They did exactly what you're doing. Forget the invitation. It was done. It was over. All right? But anyways, this guy comes up to D.L. Moody with a notepad and talks about 38 grammatical errors. Well, Brother Moody there, he, he looks at him and he replied, Young man, I'm using all the English that I know for the glory of God. Are you doing the same? There was silence, and D.L. Moody was not used to, uh, um, he was not used of God because he was an orator, a great orator. He was not used of God because he was int uh, intellectual, and he was, though. He was not used of God because he was handsome. The guy weighed 280 plus pounds. He was very large, and he had a beard, and that was just D.L. Moody. But Moody was used of God for one reason, because he said yes. Because he made himself available to God. And there's a major lesson there. You know, it doesn't matter if you're tall, handsome, or short and handsome, or um, uglier than homemade sin, or whatever, you know. <laughs> um, if you make yourself available to God, God will use you. God's good. Amen? And so he did that. Moses allowed himself to be used of God, and he was the man for the hour of that time. And then, you know what? We need to do the same thing with God. Here's something else about Moses we need to remember. Moses had a past. This guy was pulled out of the bull rushes because uh, the Pharaoh was going around killing all the male babies from two years of age and under. He was killing all the male babies, trying to reduce the population of the Israelites. And Moses' parents hid him because he was a, as a quiet child. And they put him in the, the, the basket there in the bull rushes. And the Pharaoh's daughter came and got him and made him his... Uh, her own son. So, and uh, he grows up in the palace. Praise the Lord that his own mother was uh, the one brought in to train him and teach him. So therefore, he knew that he was Jewish. He knew his background. Um, but growing up in the palace, he's got all of the training, the best training in the world. He had the best education in the world. He had military training as well. He had a knowledge that none of the Israelites had, guaranteed. He didn't have that. He was trained in leadership. He had all of that. But when he reaches the age of 40, he wants to identify with his people. Perhaps God will use me to, de uh, to deliver my people. And, uh, you know, he may have been qualified, but he wasn't what God needed at that time. He had some more training to do. Now, in his mind, he didn't think so. He sees an Egyptian slave, uh, 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 I'm sorry, an Egyptian taskmaster beating one of the Jews. He goes out there, he kills the taskmaster, and he buries him in the sand. Next day he goes out, he sees two of his brethren and, um, who despised him. Uh, brethren fighting, and he calls up, brothers, you don't need to be fighting. He says, hey, we knew what you did. He realizes people, somebody saw him and what he did. He fled for his life. Pharaoh would have killed him. He murdered a man. And so... Now, I want you to imagine what he's going through. 
all he knows is there in Egypt. He is somebody. He goes out into the wilderness. He marries an Ethiopian uh, a lady. And, so, and he has children by her. And now all he's reduced to from the palace, now he's reduced to a shepherd out in the backside of the wilderness. I guarantee you that's a broken man. And sometimes that's what God has to do to his people to make them usable. We get a lot of training. Moses had the best training in the world, but he wasn't usable. He wasn't what God needed him to be to lead God's sheep. Now, here we are another 40 years later. God pre, uh, uh, introduces himself to him at the bur burning, burning bush. God tells him the task that he needs to do. And Moses is afraid. There were times when Moses stood before the Pharaoh. He was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. He knew the customs. He knew the ways of the palace. He knew the, the, the approach to be made. He probably f called the Pharaoh at that time when he was a young boy, his, his papa or his grandpa or something like that. And so we don't know what that relationship was. But he knew the proper language. He knew the proper tongue. He knew the proper form and all the ceremonial stuff that needed to be to stand before a king, to stand before a pharaoh. It's like you and me going to stand before a president. We can't just, hey, dude, how you doing? Man, you know, we don't act that way. It's different. You've got to use some, uh, some respect. There's a proper way of doing things. And Moses knows that, and he is trembling. He says, he talks about his speech, verse 10. He says, I am not eloquent, neither hereto, heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of, of slow tongue. What's he saying? I don't speak well enough to do that. I want you to think about this for a minute. I'm sure he did when he was in the palace. But you get sought out of the palace and you get in the the, the, the shepherd field for 40 years. You got a bunch of sheep out there. Who are you going to talk to? What kind of language is the language of the shepherds? It's not the same. You, t you take yourself right now and you go live down south in Alabama for about 10 years. How are you going to be talking about 10 years from now? You're going to have an accent like you wouldn't believe. Amen? And, and you, when you go in the gas station and you say, y'all come back now, you know what they mean. All right, so there's a little bit of twang on your speech. I got a good friend, Mark Shipley. He was born and raised in Michigan. He's got the southern speech like nobody else. You would think he was born and bred down there. <laughs> you know, they say they don't say oil; they say earl. You know, they say things a little bit different. But you take Moses and you put him in the backside of the desert for forty years. How did the shepherds speak? They don't speak like they come from the palace. I'm sure he was intimidating. At first, he tried to be intimidating. I think he got humbled real fast because you see the humility in him. He wasn't the meekest man on earth when he came at, at the age of 40. I, he probably wasn't even at the age of 50, maybe around 60 or 70. But he had learned some things in the backside of the desert. I think of great orators that we can look at. Winston Churchill was a great orator. He was the prime minister of Great Britain during World War II, and he rallied the British people and led them from the brink of defeat into victory against the German Nazis. Abraham Lincoln was president in the U.S. during the Civil War when our nation was divided. He's known for his famous speech, the Emancipation Proclamation, that declared freedom for, uh, for all the slaves. And uh, then you've got Patrick Henry. If I say Patrick Henry, everybody says, give me liberty or give me death. He was a great orator. And then there's Mar Martin Luther King Jr. He was a great orator. He was famous for his speech, I have a dream. I have a dream speech. And these are great speakers, great orators. And so here Moses says, I'm not one of those anymore. Now people say, well, what happened to him? Well, Maybe it's from being out in the backside of the wilderness for about 40 years. I don't know. Some people, I've heard some people say that perhaps he had a stroke. And, and some, some people that have had a stroke, you, you know what happens. Part of their face becomes paralyzed. And so they have a hard time speaking. 
They can't fill anything. They're drooling down their mouth. The word eloquent means fluent. It means articulate, silver tongue, tongued and expressive. Moses, he wasn't that way anymore. He was at one time. I believe that. He's pretty blunt about this time in his life. And uh, he just got to the point. He didn't pull any punches. You sheep, you get, get over there, you know. And uh, uh, he was pretty blunt. Then he says, I'm slow of speech. Being slow of speech. You say, preacher, what does that mean? That's talking about his muscles in his mouth. He didn't talk a lot like he used to. And so he's in the backside of the, the, uh, the wilderness there in the desert with the sheep. I'm sure he didn't do a lot of talking. He may have been strong with his back and his shoulders and his arms from carrying sheep and everything, but he didn't do a lot of talking. So uh, he was weak in, a, in the mouth and didn't talk much. And so talking before Pharaoh, he was intimidated. He was trembling. He was scared. So in his mind, he was the most unseemly person to do what God was asking him to do because he understood some things. He understood, and he said it in the first couple of verses, they're not going to believe me. He had to convince the people. And God says, what's that in your hand? Let me show you some things. I will be with thee. And he throws it down, it becomes a serpent. He picks it up and it becomes a staff again. See, God says, I will prepare you. I will equip you for everything that you need to, uh, to do. He had to confront Pharaoh with his, with his claim, let my people go. I don't want to stand before Pharaoh. I, don't, I, don't, I hope it's not written what I did 40 years ago. And God says, don't worry about all that. I've got it all taken care of for you. See, Moses, his life changed tremendously. And he knew what it took to stand before a Pharaoh. And he says, I'm not qualified. And God says, you are qualified. You are exactly what I need you to be. See, 40 years earlier, he thought he was qualified. God says, no, you're not. Go to the backside of the desert for a while. I need to humble you. I need to break you. I need to tear you down and build you up a different way, the way that I want you to be to lead my sheep. Uh, a good friend of mine, Jimmy Tedder, he's in Shelbyville, Tennessee. He didn't have a college education. He barely made it through high school. He's a pastor there in Shelby, Tennessee. He's got a great work going of hundreds and hundreds of people that he led to the Lord. He's a great preacher. I remember one time my family and I, we went through some hard times. And as we, as we uh, go and I preach and present the ministry, the guy comes up to me and he's got some watery eyes. He says, Brother Boyd, You've been hurt before, haven't you? Wow. I just put my head down and said, yes, sir. He didn't ask. I didn't tell. He says, you're not a good preacher until you get hurt. You're a good preacher. There's something to that, folks. There's something to that. Even being a Christian, God sometimes lets us get hurt to make us better. Because God knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He says, I'm a slow speech. I'm not the one you need to, to go. See, God has often empowered those that are not eloquent. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, um, he's famous for his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. See, Jonathan Edwards was a guy that he talked monotone. He never changed the fluctuation of his ver uh, voice or anything, and he would just read everything on script during the height of the Great Awakening. He felt led of the Lord to preach the sermon a second time. That's how he preached. He read everything word for word. I got to tell you, I'm not that kind of preacher. Uh, now, listen. <laughs> I mean, I'd bore you half to death, wouldn't I, girl? <laughs> so, yeah, I'd bore you half to death. I, I write out my sermons here. I got seven pages. Seven pages is usually a message, but I study. I don't always go by my messages. I read them, and I try to stay to the, you know why? Because I don't want to go on little rabbit trails. I want to stick to the point. I want to be a blessing to you. But these are messages God gave me, and I write them out. And uh, a lot of times I stay on them. A lot of times I don't stay on them, but I've got a guideline that God's given me too. Am I criticized for it? I don't think so. Sometimes I am, sometimes. But I don't give a care, you know, because this is what God's given me. I, I know people that they got four points on there. Roman numeral one, two, three, and four, and they got that, and 
hey, if that's what God leads you to do, that's great. I know preachers that don't write out their sermons at all, and they just open their Bible, and they'll sit there and tell the song leader, sing another song, sing another song, and they're waiting for God to give them a, a message. Me, I think that's stupid. If God hadn't given you a message before you get up to preach, you don't belong behind the pulpit. But, hey, I'm not God, so anyways, but that's the way some of them do it. And uh, uh, I do believe I am led of the Holy Spirit. God leads me. Sometimes God gives me the message on Saturday night. And I don't like that. That makes me very, very, very nervous. Okay, I like to have it Monday morning. But that's not always the way God works, okay? There's things that happen during the week that he may use to, because what am I? I'm the shepherd that helps minister to the sheep and give them the needs they need, all right, because he loves you. Uh, so anyways, but during the, the, uh, the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards preached this message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And you can look at it, you can read it, and it's powerful, all right? But when you read it, when he preached that message to his own crowd, there was no effect. People just sat there, and some people just mocked him and ridiculed him. And so, you know, what do you do with a message like that? You just throw it away? No. Sometime later, the Lord led him to preach it again, a second time. And God led him to do it. God had done some preparation on some hearts. He preached that the same way, just read it monotone. It was a great revival that broke out because of that. That's why it's famous. Jonathan Edwards would not be called a great preacher in our time in the United States of America because of his style. But God says he's the man of the hour. And the great awakening in the 1700s started something tremendous here in the United States of America. And God used that man in a powerful way. You see, his preaching brought great revival. That's why we call it the Great Awakening, where God tells us to wake up. Go to, we read this this morning, but let's do it again. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Keep your finger here in Exodus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. There's something that we need to understand, the people that God uses. And you're probably going to quote it word for word. He says in here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 verse 26 he says you see your calling brethren he's talking to Christians you see your calling brethren how that not many wise men what's the next words after the flesh not many mighty not many noble and we could go on not many articulate not many English majors and so on, are called. Why? Well, we can skip down to verse 29. The purpose is that no flesh should glory in his presence. God doesn't want me to be lifted up with pride, and God knows how to humble me fast. You know, I may, for instance, I, I led the, the, the choir this afternoon. I did a terrible job, but I gave it my best. I just walked in and did it for the first time in years. And, and, and it could be somebody says, man, he stinks. Hey, give me time. I'm giving you my best, okay? <laughs> but, but, you know, here the thing is that no flesh should glory in his presence. God knows how to keep us humble. God wants to keep us usable. And when a man or a woman is lifted up with pride, God says, I can't use you. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how talented you are. Your pride is getting the glory, and I'm done with you until I break that rod of pride. And God will work on that person until it's broke. And that's what Moses went through. And if you go back to Exodus chapter 4, look at verse 13. Moses was, called the, was, was a meek man, and we see it here in verse 13. He says, and he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him, whom thou wilt send. He says, pick somebody else, please. If there's anybody else, please pick them. I'm not the right guy for what you're asking me to do. And for you and me, we can't understand that. It would be if God called you or me to go stand before the President of the United States and present something to him. Boy, my knees would be knocking. I wouldn't be able to 
talk, <laughs> you know. I would be so nervous, and so would you. And that's kind of how he was. He didn't feel qualified to do this thing. But let me say this. Many great leaders of all time, they feel inadequate. They don't feel qualified. They'll stand up there and you'll think, oh, man, that's a great speaker. Look at the confidence level in him. But that's not how they feel inside. That's what God has done for them. That's what God has equipped them to, to appear before the congregation. Because when God calls you for a task, believe me, he equips you for that. But these men don't feel qualified to handle the task that God has put before them. But it's usually these men who do the best jobs, though. Because they make themselves available and they say yes to God. And because they know they're inadequate. They know that they need help. They know they need wisdom. They know they need to lean on God to get that job done, whatever it is. And that's exactly what God wanted of Moses. And Moses said, no, get somebody else. And he says, fine. That's why God was angry. All right, you and Aaron. Aaron's your brother. He'll be your mouth. God didn't want that. Moses, I just want you and me. We can do this together. And that was the best. That's why God says not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Moses wanted to defer to someone else that he thought was more able, but that's not what God wanted. If you go over to Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, we see what God, what the Bible refers to Moses. In chapter 12 of Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers chapter 12, it says this, now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. He was meek above all the people on the face of the earth. That's powerful. You say meek. When the world sees meek, they think, oh, he's a pansy. Oh, he's weak. No. See, to, be, to do the job that he did in the backside of the wilderness to lead the sheep, he had to be a man. You know, he had to know how to lead those sheep. You know, he had to know how to fight off the wolves and the varmints and everything else. You know how to uh, pick up stones and throw them and hit your target. See, they didn't have guns and bows and all that. He had to know how to do some things. He had to be a man. And he could speak a man's language, too. He could stand up to another shepherd. Those are my sheep. Stay away from my sheep. He had to be that kind of person. So meek is power. Meek is strength. But it's humble. It's power under control. Knowing how to be strong when you need to be strong. Knowing how to be tender when you need to be tender. That's meek. And that's what Moses was. And the Bible says God made sure that we see now, the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Meek means patient, gentle, a gentle disposition. So he could be strong when he had to be strong. He could be tender when he had to be tender. And that's the man Moses. He didn't know it the first 40 years of his life. He didn't get that in the palace. The palace's wisdom, the palace's strength was the world's strength. Hey, somebody hits you, you better hit him ten times harder and knock him down. That's the world's view of strength. And God says, strength is not that. Strength is taking the hit and turning the other cheek. And that sometimes burns people up. For instance, another part of being meek, sometimes you let people tear you up verbally. I've done this before. And as they're tearing you up, you just sit there and take it. And when they're done, you turn to someone else and say something else. You say, why is that? You let them remember the last words that were said were theirs and they were hurtful. That's hard to do. That's hard to do because uh, the man wants, inside of me wants to stand up and get in the face and deal with it in a manly way. And God says, no, that's not my way. My way is through meekness and gentleness let them let the guilt be heaped on them from their own words. You see, Moses was a meek, a man of uh, patience, and, and and he was a meek man. Meekness is the opposite of pridefulness. Jesus says, "I am meek and lowly." In Matthew chapter eleven twenty nine, he also said in Matthew chapter five verse five, he says, "The meek shall inherit 
the earth. To inherit the earth, that means you need to, how to, need to know how to deal with it, need to know how to lead. And he says, the meek. Those who have power and that you know how to control it, you can be strong to the strong, you can be tender to those that need compassion. And what did it say about Jesus? Many, many times he was moved upon the multitudes with compassion. Jesus saw that they were hungry. The disciples thought it was easier to send them away. And Jesus says, no. What do you have? Well, we only have, we don't have enough money to do that. He says, no, what do you have? Well, this boy has a sack lunch. That's enough to feed 4,000 people. Bring it to me and I'll make it enough. And that's what God wanted to do with Moses as well. Give it to me and I'll make it enough. The meek shall inherit the earth. Go back to chapter 4 of Exodus, verse 16. Moses was... Uh, wasn't one the world would seek after. Verse 16 says, And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God, and thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do the signs. See, Moses seemed to be unqualified in his own mind. He wasn't uh, a take charge kind of guy, guy like he had been the first 40 years of the life. He was not the leader that we might expect a leader to be, but he was available. Like we preached this morning and in Sunday school, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. We, we shared a story about when Samuel went to anoint the next king over Israel. Saul it was, became disqualified. God's told Samuel, you've already anointed one king. Let's go anoint you another one. Quit lamenting over Saul. I'm going to want you to go to the house of uh, Jesse. At that time, God ordained that all of the sons was there, but, but uh, David. David was out in the, the, the pastures with the sheep, out in the fields with the sheep. So he had all seven of his sons there, but one. The first one, I believe his name was Eliab. He was of Saul's army. He was tall. He was strong. He looked, he looked uh, like a leader of leaders. He was somebody, all right, in the army. And so when he came before Samuel, Samuel said, surely this has got to be the man that God wants to be the next king of Israel. And God says, he's not the one. And I believe that Samuel was shocked because God told him, man looks on the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. Oh, okay. well, okay. Well, the next one, well, it's got to be him. And the next one, if it's not him, I don't know what to think. All the way through, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's nobody left. Can you imagine Samuel scratching his head and said, well, um, is there anybody else? Well, there's that little ruddy boy, David. But who is he? He's just a little guy. He's out there watching the sheep. Well, I'm not sitting down until you bring him to me. And so he stands there. You're going to be standing for a while. Bring him to me. They go out and get David. These guys are not happy about it. They bring David in. Little David. And the Bible teaches us that they were all there and witnessed. God told Samuel, this is the one. Because his heart was right to God. God had trained that man from a youth all the way up for the purpose of being the next king of Israel. His heart was tender and right to God. He was exactly what needed to be to be the next king of Israel. We're talking about a, somebody that we read about in 40-some chapters of the Bible or more. And so God used him in such a powerful way. All of his brothers there were there watching as Samuel anointed him to be the king. We read later on, they resented him to the point when he went there and Goliath was mouthing off and cursing God. Hey, how come you guys don't do anything? Somebody needs to step up. He's blaspheming the God of Israel. Shut up, you little shepherd boy. Go back home and tend to your little flock. It's kind of the attitude they had. Hey, you're talking to the next king of Israel here, buddy. He gets out there with a sling and stone and puts that guy on the ground and cuts his head off. He's a hero. He did something that God, um, that nobody else was really able to do. All right, Moses, he didn't think he was adequate, but God uses, used him because God chose him. Bible teaches us that God sets one up. God can take one down. God knows what he's doing. I think of Peter and John. Peter and John in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, 
the Bible talks about the way the world viewed them. He says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. What are these guys doing? Who are they? They're not learned. They've not been to school. They're just fishermen. But listen to them. Look what they're doing. How can they have such an impact on these people? I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. But then it goes on to say, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. There's the key. They'd been with Jesus. My friends, that's what we need to do is spend time with the Lord. You know, you look at yourself and you say, ah, God can't use me on the buses. God can't use me to teach children. God can't use me to do this. God can't use me to do that. Wait a minute. Have you tried to make yourself available to God? Have you tried to say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And then follow through. Whatever God asks you to do, I'm telling you, you can do it. We looked at the life of David, and it says when he was anointed, God was with him the rest of his life. We are saved. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That means God is with us for the rest of our life. That's good. You can do whatever God calls you to do. Let me ask you this. We're getting winding down to the end of the 2016. In the year 2017, we're going to be asking for more help in different areas. I've got some goals that I, I believe we can reach. I want to add another bus to our bus route. Actually, I want to add two more. And I, what we've done, Matthew had the, uh, the meeting here, and I, we did we did principles, Bible principles. David told uh, when he became king, whoever takes this city, you'll be the next captain of my army. Joab did it, so he was the next captain. We're asking the teens to, you, if you want a bus route, Break them up in two or three groups. All right, whoever brings in the most, you get the bus. You'll be the bus captain. Why? Because they proved themselves. They proved they want it. They proved that they're going to dedicate themselves to do it. And I told them, I says, listen, if you pack that bus out and we're bringing the van in, we're have to make another trip. So I can approach the church and say, hey, we need four or five, six thousand dollars to get another bus. I guarantee you, if you're doing that, these people say, here's the money. Let's go, go do it. And if we do it again where we're filling up two buses and we need another one, I can approach these people and I say, listen, we need some more money. You know what the people do? They'll say, you got it, man. Because there'll be such a buzz and excitement in the, in the, in the air <clears throat> that they'll see what God's doing. They'll want to do it. You know, isn't that right? I believe that. So on that note, I'm going to be asking more people Let's get involved. We got some people that we meet in that room every week. They want to learn to win people to Christ. Oh, I'm excited about that. I don't know if we can reach 200 by the end of 2017, but I'll tell you what, we're going to try. If we get 150, 180, I'll be excited about that, but I'm going to push for 200. And we want your prayers. And so here's the thing. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for me. And as we have these goals and desires, if God calls you to do something, will you say yes to God? Will you allow yourself to be available to whatever God has you to do? That's all I ask. Be available to God. And don't think, oh, I can't do that. Wait a minute. Look at Moses. Look at some of these other guys felt they were unqual- that they felt they were not qualified to do. You can do whatever God qualifies you to do. I don't want to push anybody into doing something that you don't want to do. But I want you to do whatever God calls you to do. Amen? That's the difference. Let's all stand to our feet and pray. We're going to give an invitation. And as the piano plays, after we're done praying, if the Lord's...